Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. When I was like 13 years old, probably close to 12 years ago, I went trick or treating with some friends from school. We were the type to bring pillowcases and get as much as we could, then weigh at the end of the night. We've been all over the neighborhood. We lived in a suburban area, but we were quick. We were able to get most of the houses before lights started turning off, and we all had a hefty turnout of candy. Trick or treating was starting to calm down by this point. The time must have been around 9.30 or 10 maybe. There was this one house with the lights off, but we still walked up anyway because they were a couple cars parked outside. We rang the doorbell and nothing, so we rang a few times, still nothing. I'm not defending what we did at all, we were seriously stupid kids back then. One of us starts banging on the door and talking bad like, we're gonna egg your house and so on. Right after that, this man jumps out of the door and basically slams it open. We all jump back startled, it was pitch black inside his house. Where were the other people? There were two cars right in front of his house. He had to be late 20s or early 30s with a scruffy beard, wearing a white beater and black zip up hoodie and had this look of total rage in his eyes. He comes out with this huge dog on a leash that starts barking, growling, and showing his teeth in our face. I couldn't really make it out at the time, but it appeared as though he had a knife in his other hand as well. We're terrified because we didn't expect this. He just busts out the front door and starts chasing us down and we start sprinting away in total fear. He's screaming things like, I'm gonna kill you, and you shouldn't have screwed with me, or better hope my dog doesn't catch you, or get back over here. He ran after us for probably 10-ish minutes. The whole time he was just frantically waving his arm with a knife, shouting mostly incoherently with his dog by his side on that leash. It was horrifying. We got away thankfully, somehow managed to lose him after running for a while, but I can't imagine what would have happened if we stayed there for any longer. I'd probably be chow for his dog, but thankfully we were all pretty healthy kids so we could outrun him. I'm honestly surprised that nobody else was really around to see this maniac chasing us in the middle of the streets. I knew it was later at night, but still. We had to beeline back to my place looking over over our shoulders the whole time because we didn't notice when we lost him and we didn't see him walk back towards his house. He was just gone after we turned a few corners. Now, I understand it would be frustrating for some kids to be at your door being annoying like that, but what gets me is that the reaction from this guy didn't really seem appropriate. I would have just opened the door and told the kids to screw off or threatened to call the cops or something like that. We went back to my parents' house and played Smash Bros on the Wii all night and ate a bunch of candy. We managed to hold onto our pillowcases of candy the whole way home. My friends started crying after we got back. We locked all the doors and windows obviously. We were pretty sure he wasn't around when we went into my house so it seemed safe. That guy's house was right in front of the middle school I went to and I had to walk right by his house to get to school every day. So fearing for my safety I told my dad. We went back to that house the next day to knock on the door. In hindsight we probably should have called the cops and let them handle it but my dad is a confrontational no BS type of guy. So we went over and knocked on the door. This time there were three cars in front of the house. This mother opens the door and we could see inside their kids watching TV. When we told her what happened, her face went pale and she immediately rounded up her family and got them outside, fearing this crazy person might still be in her house. She told us that her family went out to another friend's house in the city next to ours for Halloween that night to do all their trick or treating. They didn't get home until the next morning because they stayed the night there. It was at that point that cops were called to search the house while we all stood outside. They didn't find anything though, no trace of him turned up. He must have been long gone by then. It turned out that the guy was able to get into their house because there was a window unlocked in the daughter's room on the bottom floor near the front door. Luckily, nobody was in the house that night. The only notable thing the woman could tell the police was that she noticed a car with dark windows parked down the street for a while but didn't think anything of it. He must have been posted up in there with his dog scoping out houses and noticed this whole family get in a car and leave and figured that would be a good opportunity to make his move. So who was this guy? Nothing was stolen from the house, and nothing looked ransacked or the family obviously would have noticed. The family said the front door was still locked when they got back too, so he must have locked it again and went out through that same window to cover his tracks. I'm pretty sure this was before those ring doorbell cameras were popular, and I don't think they had any security cameras set up either. I'm not sure to be honest, maybe he was just a drug addict and didn't have a reason for any of it. His eyes did seem pretty crazy and wide open, like he was strung out on something. 
This happened to me a few years back. I was living on my own in the city and was unemployed at the time, usually out looking for work and trying to stay busy. One early afternoon, I was heading back to my neighborhood after running some errands downtown and boarded a tram that would take me almost all the way home. There was a park that I would have to cross between the stop and my home, but crossing it would only take a few minutes. So I boarded the tram, which was mostly empty. Besides me, there was one younger man in the second carriage and the driver up front in the first. I find an empty two seater the rows are quite narrow but i'm comfortable i put my earbuds in and look out the window as we start moving out of downtown and towards home we pass a couple of stops and don't pick up any new passengers there had probably been a tram right in front of us who took all the people so it was particularly empty compared to normal at the third stop the doors behind me open but i don't pay much attention until a stocky man average height probably in his 50s with neat short hair and inconspicuous clothes suddenly sits down on the next seat next to me the rows are very narrow this guy is basically trapping me. I can't get past him without his cooperation. He greets me with a huge smile and says hi as he sits down. On this particular day, being down about not finding work and it being broad daylight, I decide I do not want to play along. I just want to listen to my music and I don't like this man's vibe. I tell him I'm not in the mood to talk and he needs to go sit somewhere else. Wrong answer. That man goes from 0 to 100 in 0 0.2 seconds and his face contorts with rage as he starts yelling at me from the top of his lungs. I wish there was an exaggeration duration, but unfortunately it isn't. He was loud. You are a terrible person. You don't clean yourself. You stink of sweat. I didn't. He did. He goes on and on about what an abomination of a person I am, and I have sort of a freeze reaction. Inside, I am getting very scared. I start looking for a way out, but I'm trapped. I look over to the young man, hoping he will come to my rescue. I can tell he is hoping to stay out of it, but after I've been screamed at for maybe two whole minutes, he finally says meekly, you better calm down, which of course doesn't help. So he just gives up and goes back to whatever he was doing, probably looking at his phone. I am hoping that the driver might react as he has a clear view to the back of the tram and there's no way he's not hearing what's going on, but again, nothing. The stocky man, maybe frustrated that I'm not reacting to his insults, escalates the abuse and starts screaming that he's going to kill me. At this point, I have to do something and unconsciously probably decide that the only way is through. I'm so done with the situation, so before I even realize what I'm doing, I just get up and push past him. It's all survival instinct. Scared that he's going to follow me, I move quickly towards the front of the tram. He gets up and follows me, all red-faced, shouting how he knows where I live and that I need to clean myself behind my ears, that I stink and that he's going to kill me. Again, the driver does nothing. As we pull up to the next stop, which is the stop before mine, I wait until the very last minute before I ask the driver to let me out the front door, which he does. I slip out quickly in hope of escaping without being followed. I don't dare taking the time to look over my shoulder. I just hurry down the steps and away from the stop. I am so scared. Only when the tram has left the station do I take a second to look around me and he's not there. A brief sense of relief washes over me before I start worrying that he's going to get off at the next stop, which is normally my stop, and that he will be waiting for me there. It should have come as no surprise that I do not want this guy to follow me through the park or know where I live, so I spend a good hour just walking around, trying to get my nervous system out of panic mode and staying close to shops where there are other people around before I finally make my own way home. This happened when I was 21 years old, and I am fully aware I made a lot of poor decisions in my younger days. I am very lucky to have survived, and here's one of my stories. I have just met with a cousin at the mall I hadn't seen in a long time. At this point, I had been living in South America for about a year and had started feeling overly confident. I have been told many times about the dangers of taking a taxi from the street. Some people always take them, and some people never do. It's obviously never worth the risk, but I look obviously foreign, and I should have known better. My cousin says, I I always take street taxis, I'll find us a good cheap one. This was my first time ever taking a street taxi. She finds one and waves me over, looking back, I am flabbergasted as to how I got into an all black car. Again, these cars could just be normal taxis, they exist, but it's even more riskier than taking the yellow ones. The first red flag was how silent he is. After chatting away for some time, we realized it was taking far too long. I could see the smile in my cousin's eyes fade as we both realized at the same time that we are nowhere near home. She asks him, where are we going? and he mumbles under his breath, not really saying anything. We both know at the same time that something is very wrong. I remember vaguely thinking we had just went into a circle and wondering why he'd waited so long to rob us. It had to have been over 30 minutes. He finally gets off a highway and stops the car just past the ramp and we are on a very quiet street. He opens his dashboard and pulls out a gun. I'm terrified to say the least, in that moment, all you think about is surviving. A car drives by and he yells, don't turn your head. He then tells us to give him everything we have. I take off my backpack and even my 
my jacket out of panic. He orders us to hand over our phones, which we oblige. He then says, I will let you go, but if you turn around to look at my license plate, I will come and kill you. He lets us out of the car and we run for it, but we are in a very, very bad area. I'm dressed inappropriately for the area, especially after handing over my jacket. A foreigner wouldn't dare come here. Everyone on the streets was staring at me up and down and one man yells, aren't you going to get cold? I tried to cover myself with my hands as I felt so unsafe. We ask a couple of people to try and contact for help, but what do you know, they have no more minutes on their phone. In South America, it can be very dangerous and very poor. We find no police, but we do find security patrol people. They take us back to their office to contact the police, only for them to tell us we have no data and the phones are broken. So my cousin and I keep walking. It's the middle of the night and we are again in some obscure area. An hour must have passed by now. Then we see a police car and we are running for it. We tell them we had just been robbed and they ask, did you get a license plate number? I reply, no. The police officer shrug and say, he's probably at the club now celebrating all the money he made and proceeded to laugh. I then ask to use their phone to have someone come pick us up to which he says, hurry up, I don't have much data. We get home, but I find out that the person who robbed us used my cousin's phone to contact her family. Luckily, she was already with her parents at the time when they called, but there was a woman in the background crying hysterically, faking to be my cousin and they were trying to get a ransom from her parents. He was never found and nothing was done. I wonder what would have happened if it had just been one of us, and I am grateful that nothing more sinister happened. A week later, my friend and I are ordering a taxi, the safe way of course. While we are waiting, a similar black car pulls up next to us, asking if we need a taxi. We immediately say no. As he drives off, I turn to look at his car, and what do you know, he has no license plate in broad daylight. I'm not insinuating it was the same person. Of course it wasn't, there are over 10 million people in the city. My point is that it happens a lot in South America and never to get too comfortable. This experience made me realize what it's really like to live in a developing country, even if you have money and stay in good areas. You always need to be high alert and no one is immune to the constant fear of Will I be robbed today? Brief setting in context, I'm a woman in my 30s, caring for my elderly parents, so staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often leave the window open at night since I needed to be cool to sleep, and I haven't really worried about it, since there's a cabinet with an aquarium in front of the window area, not blocking the window from view, and I can reach to open and close it, but it would make it difficult for someone to climb in. My dog, Sable, also always sleeps in the room with me. While she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises, and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. So I've never really worried about the open window. After tonight, I won't be able to do it again. It started at maybe 3.30, 4am sometime, I was awake. Since I care for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns and I'm awake at odd hours hours. I was reading a book and heard Sable growl, low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began pacing a bit, looking up at the window before jumping up at the cabinet by the window, barking. I shouted, hey, we're calling the police, my dog will bite, just in case there was someone there, and went to look out of the curtains to the side. I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left side curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right side curtain too tucking it down so any wind wouldn't be able to move it. I wasn't really alarmed then. It's a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally someone passing by or the neighbor's gate next door will make Sable growl or bark, but she doesn't usually react the way she did this time. She'll usually growl but stay on the bed, and her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that even if it was someone scooping out the open window to potentially break in, they'd see now that the room was occupied by a person and dog and would go find an easier target, but mainly I guessed it was just a random noise that she heard outside. I was wrong. It was a good half hour or more later after I'd relaxed and thought I might doze off soon. Then I heard her growl again, a really serious deep and low growl, and I listened, again, thinking it might be foxes or something, but I heard what sounded like deep breathing noises. I sat up and looked up at the window and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom, like someone peeking under it, and I could still hear 
hear the heavy breathing. I shouted hey again and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain and saw the figure of a man move away from the window to the right towards the front door and the exit of the front garden. Too dark to make out features or clothing, it was just a dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew he'd moved away and wasn't at or under the window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone and called 911. One thing that creeps me out in hindsight is that it would have taken a few seconds for me to move from the bed to the side of the window, and that was after I'd shouted and he knew he'd been seen. But he must have stayed there even knowing I'd seen him, until I moved the curtain and could see out. Then he moved away. The heavy breathing also had to be deliberate. It was so loud, like someone trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police, I went around the ground floor of the house turning lights on, making sure the rest of the house was still secure and it was. Very careful to lock doors and all the other windows at night and everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5am and took the report. They suggested asking the neighbors if they have camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the area tomorrow and they went to drive around the area saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5 a.m., the time the police arrived anyway. Since the dark meant I only saw the shape of a person, no real description, I doubt they can do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man, but the breathing and the figure I saw instantly made me think male. The outline of his head looked smooth, so either bald or wearing a tight cap, and height would have been probably around 5'8 to 5'10. I'm still shaken, but feeling angry and violated, and wishing we had a camera system now. We'll be looking into that. I never thought anything like that would happen. Don't have any enemies, no recent exes, no one I know of harboring any grudges, since I'm caring for my parents full time now. I'm not out socializing or making any enemies, nor are my elderly and disabled parents. I have to think it was someone who was looking to break into a house, but for the fact that they came back so much later, maybe someone on drugs or having a mental health episode. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back of the garden with only a small side gate, meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out. It would be easy for someone to access against the back of the house. They were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and a dog were in the room, perhaps hoping I would have fallen asleep by then maybe. This happened a few weeks ago. I work at a gas station and have years of experience in a previous one, so getting this job was a piece of cake. Only this was different as it was lone working. Working 8 hour shifts entirely by yourself. The shifts included night as well. So my shift started early afternoon, about maybe half an hour to my shift this guy walks in. I've seen him before as he entered the shop the day before and randomly asked me if I had any shopping bags to spare. The guy was giving me some uncomfortable vibes but luckily someone else was working with me that day for a short while so I asked them to deal with that guy. My colleague said we don't have anything to spare you and told him bye, the guy leaves. The next day the same guy walks in and I thought, what does he want now? He walks up to the desk and starts chatting to me. He was asking me some advice about his living situation as he told me he used to be homeless. Since to me it's not really my place to give advice, I just shrugged and told him to just sleep on it and think about things. He then left. He didn't enter the store to buy anything at all, just a chat but thinking back I remember that he asked what time I got off and stupidly told him 11 o'clock tonight. I went on with my shift as usual up until about 9.30 p.m. as the same guy returns but with another guy who may I say look dodgy, all dressed in black and hood up. The guy who entered the shop previously pokes his head into the door and asked if I do phone top ups. We do but something in my gut was telling me to make him leave now so I lied and told him we do not. So the guy and his dodgy friend hang outside the store for a bit while I was serving customers then until the shop seemed quiet again, they both entered the store and looked all around the shop. I noticed the dodgy guy kept his hands in his pockets the whole time and then a thought struck me. I might be getting robbed tonight, so I took some deep breaths and tried to keep calm and just thought of my training I repeated in my head. I thought to myself that I should just stand and be ready with one hand under the desk hovering over the panic button. I thought to myself the minute they pull a weapon out on me is when to hit the button as it's silent alarm and just pray the police arrive on time. Well, they just ended up buying a bottle of water as of course I did notice there was someone still outside in their car. I I felt a huge sigh of relief thinking they just wanted water, or they decided not to rob me because there's another person outside. They both leave the store but again hang around outside, right by the door. Then I see the car drive away and I thought to myself, I don't want these guys in the store again, not while I'm completely alone. So I flip the switch that automatically locks the main door. Half an hour passes, I had no customers and still the two guys are still hanging around outside. I call my boss to tell him what's going on 
on and to give him a heads up that at some point I'm going to have to call the police and have them move them along as it's making me very anxious. Then another guy shows up and joins the guys all dressed in black and wearing those COVID masks. He also hands his friend's mask too then he makes his way around the back of the store. Then I realize the back door, the one I go out from to smoke. I ran to the back door, slammed it shut and locked it. At this point I was scared for my life as these guys stack around the place to which felt like an hour and a half. I hid in the office watching the cameras. I picked up the phone and dialed the non-emergency number for the police. At this point I was really freaking out. The next thing I hear is my cell phone ringing as a colleague calls me to check in on me. I told him what's happening when I came out the office to take a peek and of course those guys were right up to the window knocking to grab my attention and they saw me with two phones to my ears. They saw me. I said to my colleague on the phone. Then I came up with an idea. I put the phone I had making a call to the police down and kept my colleague on the phone. I said, listen, I'm going to see what they want. Stay on the phone. I'm going to put you on speaker. Stay quiet. Don't say a word. Just listen. If you hear me say the till is slow, you hang up and call the police. That's me telling you I'm in danger. So I put him on speaker and hide my phone in my bra. I head to the window. What's up guys? Can I help you? Guy, why is the door locked? That's because we're in night mode right now. Doors are locked, but I can surf through the hatch. What can I get you? They just look at each other and whisper amongst themselves. Guy, we'll just take some smokes and a lighter. Sure, one moment. I grab what they ask and they push a $20 note through. I grab the $20 and of course check it. Then I rang them up but as I had their change ready I saw one hand through the hatch. I dropped their change into that hand avoiding contact. Okay thanks. I stared them down and they left. I demanded that my shifts are to be changed to morning shifts after that night or I'm quitting. Back when I was around 17 or 18, I would go out to parties with my friend at night. It was my best friend at the time, Ivan, and his cousin Caesar that would invite me out that night. I had been talking to a friend of Ivan on Facebook about meeting each other. This girl had a birthday party that day and invited us all to join her. So I took a bath, got ready, and my friends pulled up for me in a small car. I said bye to my mom and got in, and we went to buy beer for the night and a pack of smokes for everyone. Back then, I would smoke a lot. My friend told us that he had been in contact with this girl Facebook and that she accepted to come to the party with him tonight. We were all impressed and happy for him. We pulled to her house and parked near a park to wait for her. I remember a group of people walking around the park but since they seemed at her age we weren't too bummed out. My friend called her to come out and my friend Caesar stepped off her smoke. I was sitting in the back not wanting to come out because of these guys outside. They seemed to be asking for trouble because they begun to argue about something really dumb with him. So my friend Ivan told me to step out just to have his back in case anything went down. We went to the party and had a great time. I hit it off with the girl I was talking to and later found out she kissed pretty much every dude that was there before me. Nevertheless, I was still grateful for the opportunity and said goodbye. As we headed back to my house of my friend's date, she seemed very quiet. I knew they hit it off during the party but now looked stiff and even scared. My bud and I were riding in the back to let them have the front to themselves but she was just nervously looking at her phone. When we arrived, she wanted to get out and my friend trying to score points said, wait, I'll walk you in. She did not like this and said just go. We were a bit buzzed in the back and wanted to have a smoke so we all stepped outside and watched them go to her door. I remember laughing about something with my friend when the mood suddenly became so dark. She started screaming go now, get out of here. A car pulled out nearly in front of us and people with bats and blunt instruments got off so fast I barely remember how I got back into the back seat. The girl said something along the lines of leave them alone and held him while a bunch of dudes got out. My friend Ivan got into the driving seat and started the car. Thankfully, it started right up without trouble, but a big bottle of liquor then hit the windshield, cracking the top corner. I saw some guys come from the right side of the car where we were standing and quickly went to the other side to let my friend have easy way in into the back right seat. As I turned the corner, I saw this massive looking guy come up to me and barely had time to close the door and to pull the lock down. Dude was punching my window. My other friend wasn't so lucky since he actually got hit in the head and had barely made it in the car. He couldn't even close the door because one guy was grabbing his leg. All of this happened in the span of 6 seconds. I acted all out of instinct and thankfully we got in and my friend stepped in the gas while zigzagging in case they would shoot at us. We were all scared and wondered what had happened. As we got back to our neighborhood, my friends were fuming. Both of them knew their way around the fight and could hold their own. Thankfully, I still had some cash left and told them we should go buy some illegal beer at midnight and tried my best to calm them down and convince them to not go back. My friend Caesar had actually woken a dude up in the middle of the night with a phone call and the man was ready to show up and throw down. After a few beers and a lot of talking, I convinced them it wasn't worth it and to just let the night end. I got home and my parents never found out and I just fell asleep. 
The next few days, my friend Ivan called me and told me that the girl's ex-boyfriend was actually a lead gang member. My heart dropped out of my chest. We had been seconds away from getting beat down and maybe killed by a bunch of people for a date. If it wasn't for our quick reaction and her backing them up a bit, we may have not made it. All I can say is trust your gut and your instincts in the end. It can all happen so fast. Many years ago, before kids, rescue animals, a mortgage, and a husband, I was a travel writer in Europe. I did most of my trips alone. This story is about the first time I visited Prague. I had never been to Prague and the trip was last minute so I had little time to prepare. My travel partner had dumped me in another country and I was determined to make the best out of my trip by visiting a place I'd never been. Upon arrival at the train station, I visited the accommodation office and asked for a hostel not far from the center. In my early 20s, winging it was part of the fun. These days, I'm far less adventurous. The hostel they sent me to was a sprawling, crumbling, slate gray, decoration building on a nondescript street about a 10 minute walk to Stairmesto. The inside was probably beautiful at one time, but by the time I checked in it was full of shabby, mismatched furniture and cheap stained carpet. Most of the light fixtures were broken, leaving everything but the lobby dark and gloomy. It smelled of standing water and dust. I found my room, a double for $12 per night, and it made note of the fact that I had a roommate. She wasn't there, but on her side of the room there was a suitcase, dressed neatly folded across the back of a plastic chair. A scattered of makeup containers on the beat up desk and a stack of German fashion magazines on the bed. As I had no plans or goals on this impromptu trip, so I spent the afternoon exploring Old Town Square, the Jewish Quarter, and Wenceslas Square. I purchased some Sheck crystal for my mom and painted eggs from a street vendor for myself. I also made reservations for a sunset dinner cruise for one. At around 6 p.m., I returned to my room to shower, change clothes, and unload my purchases. When I left my room about an hour later, there was no indication that my roommate had returned at any point during the day. After the cruise, I stopped at a tiny bar in Tinska and had a glass of wine. It was nearly midnight when I returned to my hostel, so I was surprised to find that my roommate still hadn't returned. That wasn't uncommon though. Backpackers are a fickle lot. She could have gone on a short overnight trip and just left her stuff behind, hooked up with someone and was holed up at their place, or hanging out at another hostel, so I was surprised but not concerned. I took another shower before bed, however, and was surprised to find that things in the room had changed up in my return. Her bed was deeply turned down, the magazines had moved to the nightstand, and the dress was gone. The strangest thing though was the addition of a pink silky nightgown spread across the bed, my bed. Maybe she thought she still had the room to herself. I didn't see how, my shopping bags, clothes, and toiletries were in plain view. I gently moved the nightgown over to her bed and then settled in for the night as I wrote in my journal. I assumed she was in the shower or somewhere nearby so I expected her to return shortly. After about an hour though, her side was still empty. I needed to use the restroom before I went to sleep, so I made one last trip down the hall. The building was unusually quiet. There weren't the regular sounds of chatty backpackers, the clinking of glasses, or music that would normally leak through the walls. There was nothing. It was hushed, like a church after the congregation has left. I found myself practically tiptoeing back. My room was near the end of the hall, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the corridor was darker than before. The few working lights were blinking as they struggled to stay lit, and it reminded me of a funhouse. A Tightness began to fill my stomach and I subconsciously quickened my steps. There wasn't a soul behind me yet, I kept glancing back over shoulder, convinced I'd see someone gaining momentum on me. The only sound was the soft thud of my flip-flops as they struck my soles. I was flooded with relief as I flung open my door, but it didn't last long. Everything was exactly as it left it, except for the silky nightgown which was now back on my bed. Sleep came in fits and starts. I left the lamp on for a while, still convinced my roommate would be right back, but the shadows it cast made the room even spookier. It was too dark with the light off. I'd finally slipped into a deep sleep when I suddenly heard the door open. A man stood in the darkened doorway, the hall light behind him showing just enough for me to see his contorted face. I didn't mean to, he sobbed. You have to help me. Too confused and disoriented to be scared, I sat up, scrubbed up my eyes, and reached for the lamp switch. But once the room was light, I saw that the door was closed. There was no man. I quickly bounded off the bed and went for the door. It was locked. Nobody could have entered without a key, and the hallway empty. I passed the rest of the night fully clothed, sitting up in my bed, and with the light on. Though I'd pay for two more nights, at 7am I gathered all of my stuff and went down to the reception desk to check out. By the way, I said to the 20-something receptionist, my roommate never returned, I'm a little concerned. She picked up the room key, looked at it hard, frowned, and then glanced at her computer. What room were you in again? When I repeated it to her, she looked back at her screen. Ma'am, that room's been empty for three weeks and it's been cleaned since. We only have six people in the whole building. 
The hostel has since been renovated and is now a luxury hotel. At the time of the story, it's mid-October, I'm 20 years old and a senior in college. I got out of class at 9pm and headed downtown in my college town to see about an open mic thing that was supposed to be happening at a lounge. And around that time, there was a guy who would play accordion on one of the corners of the main through of hair. Didn't find accordion guy, and either the place was closed or it wasn't an open mic night. Don't quite remember. But as I'm walking back down one of the main streets in downtown that heads back onto campus, I came across this very drunk woman begging two other women for a ride home. I think the girls were getting into an uber or they didn't have space or something. Point is, the other women weren't taking her and couldn't slash wouldn't help her. Mind you, this is a Thursday at 9ish at night. When she finds that the other women can't help her and I'm walking past, she turns to me to ask for my help getting home. For context, I still have my backpack on. My phone's running low, but I've been at this school and in this town for three years at this point, so I know downtown and campus pretty well on foot. To note, I do not have a car at this point in time. She gives me an address and it's maybe 15 to 20 minutes walk north slightly northeast of where we were at, and I knew the general area where it was, so I was more than happy to be a good Samaritan and walk a drunk woman home who didn't feel safe. I would regret this later. She's incredibly thankful and overjoyed that someone is willing to help her get home. The route we were going to take was super straightforward and I knew exactly where I was in relation to the rest of the town. She says that she has to pee really badly. I reassure her it won't be that long and she'll be back at her place. She says that she was out with her boyfriend and he left her at the bar alone drunk and mad at her about about something. Says she's from out of state. I commiserate with her that what he did was bad. She asked me about what I'm studying. I confided that I was finishing a bachelor's of science and in information technology. She's bemoaning this boyfriend that's at home that I'm walking her back to. She keeps trying to walk with me up against my side or slightly behind me and I'm like no walk slightly ahead of me or keep some space. She has a dermal piercing on her cheekbone that's hard to miss. She's getting more and more manic and weird as we walk along. We get about a half a mile into north downtown less than a mile from the address she gave me, and the boyfriend's calling her and being a real douche. I'm about done with this guy from the stuff she's telling me about this and that and the other thing, so she puts him on speakerphone and I tell him to chill out. We're on such and such road close by. His tone changes in an instant. He goes from hostile and angry to surprisingly chill. That threw up a million more red flags for me. She starts saying that I'm going to have a good time at her house. I'm looking for an exit. Every bone in my body is screaming at me to get out of this situation. We get to the end of the road, which coincides with an intersection that has a gas station. I say, hey, let's stop here to use the bathroom. She says that she doesn't have to use the bathroom anymore. I'm scared. I tell her, well, maybe you don't have to, but I do, which was true. We go into the gas station. I head immediately to the bathroom and text one of my friends asking if she was working and if she could pick me up or if I needed to call the campus safe ride home program. Friend says it'll be a minute if I'm willing to wait. I agree to wait. I come out of the bathroom and this drunk woman, if she was even actually drunk to begin with, has vanished. No Nowhere in the store, nowhere outside that I care to look. I buy a soda and wait for my friend and her friends to come save me, effectively. I am later told that maybe the woman was affiliated with human trafficking, and to be honest, with the vibes and the changes in tone and the narrative that was being spun around me walking this woman home, and how she just completely vanished on me when I got to a safe place with lights and cameras and such, I have to wonder if that wasn't the plan. I won't ever know for certain, but it certainly scared the ever-loving daylights out of me as a 20-year-old. My friend and her friends pull up and take me back to one of their dorms and I spend more of the evening with them so I wasn't alone. Forever thankful for three underclassmen for rescuing me from a gas station at 10pm. Last year I was on vacation in southern Europe with a large group of friends. We have been there for a while and always took an Uber from our rented house to the city which had very nice bars and clubs. The thing with Uber is, it allows very cheap and flexible transport but it also opened the door to a lot of creeps. I've had Uber drivers who are super cool but also extremely drugged up road ragers who drive like maniacs and think they're impressive but the guy we had that day was by far the worst. It is late evening and Uber picks us up and drives me. 27 year old male, another one, 25 year old female and 24 year old female to the desired old town where we plan to go clubbing and drink. While driving, the driver constantly looks at the two women in the back seat via the mirror. They only told me this afterwards. He kept starting conversations but basically only addressed the girls who left answering to the guys who gave short non-detailed answers, basically signaling that we, one, don't want 
to talk and to don't think he needs to know our plans. To us, he seemed way too pushy and he wasn't really that big on hygiene. Meanwhile, we can't wait to arrive at our destination and get out of this uncomfortable but not super horrible situation. But that stuff did not feel this great when this guy didn't stop on the road but instead pulled into a parking spot. He started fumbling with his phone and we were like, all right, weird, but let's get out and left the car. To our surprise, the guy then turned the car off and got out as well. We saw that red flag and just started walking away towards the bar area of the town without saying a word. Cars can't enter the old town. After 400 feet, once we reached the gates, we stopped because this was the meeting spot for the other half of our group, who took a separate Uber, and found out that this guy was following us and stopped as well. You know the classic circle people form while talking, where one guy is just kind of standing next to it because people don't let him in? Yeah, we did that. We started making conversation about how long the others will take to get here, where they are right now, etc. And this guy keeps throwing in comments like he is a part of the group. Oh cool, even more people. This must be a great evening. Then we texted our friends at a group chat that we are changing their meeting place to this bar because the Uber driver is following us around and we want to lose him. So one of us started leading the group at a quick pace through the streets. They are very small, lots of people, high old town buildings all around them. We make turns at every corner trying to lose the guy but he follows. Finally, we reached a big plaza where there were hundreds of people closely together, basically queuing to enter the narrow street up ahead. We pushed through like rude douchebags and successfully lost the guy. Finally, we could head straight to the bar after our detour and linked up with the other part of our group. Two hours pass, life is all good. We decide to head to another bar a bit further away because the drinks and prices kind of sucked in this one. We had two drinks in that bar and guess who walks through the door and stands next to the table? That guy. Hey guys, he says. At this point, a friend, 28 year old male, who is good at communicating and frankly quite big, tells the guy that we want to keep to ourselves and have no interest in hanging out with him. Please leave us alone. Fortunately, the guy says it is no problem and leaves. Unfortunately, at around 3 a.m., while dancing in the crowd at a club, the same guy announced his presence by tenderly pressing his body against the back of one of the girls who he has been staring at through the mirror in the car. The girl's boyfriend recognizes the guy, gets angry, grabs him by the collar, and essentially tells him that if he keeps following us, he will get beaten up. A bouncer sees this and approaches them. I start talking to the bouncer, who is super annoyed by anyone intervening at first, but after hearing how this guy stalked us from this car to this club, he just asks the Uber guy a few questions, then proceeds to throw him out. We stayed a bit longer than we wanted, in hopes of him not waiting for us. After that, we reported the guy for being a creep in the app and called another Uber, which thankfully wasn't him. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Two years ago, I moved to the UK for university as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too bad for me. In first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year without meeting my boyfriend, who I'm still with and just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyhow, as second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations, but at least we had our own house and weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as living in a small shared flat like in first year. No, I had a ground floor room and my window gave into a very small backyard in which I would go smoke every day as I am a smoker and in which there would be a very thin wooden door giving into the other side of the street where you would put your bins and broken chairs blah blah. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard but since it was an old door we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. I had neighbors on each side of the house so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five boys who looked way over the age of being in university. They were strange, so to say. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them having cuts everywhere on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by a kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do so we offered him our help to clean himself and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his clothes. We then saw the guy who hurt these flatmates being escorted out by the police and into a van and driven off to be arrested. I don't know anything more about the story. The police didn't really tell us anything else. Anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of BS and kept trying to grab me and flirt with me, but we just wanted to make sure he was okay as we didn't know him. Then after some time had passed, I would go to uni and come back home and see him quite often in the street and just never said a word to him again. But 
one day he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and started talking to me weirdly and I didn't feel comfortable at all with that for some reason so I just didn't respond to him. He then just said, oh that's okay, I'll just wait in front of your house then and we can talk further. No need to say I was creeped out and just thought he was joking. So I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street and as I turned into the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep and waiting for me. So I went back to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away, but obviously he wasn't home and no one else was there either. So I literally just waited it out until they left about an hour later and then sprinted back home and locked the front door. Note, my front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy and mostly succeeded for a while. But then one day, as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open and the strings that were put there to keep it closed were cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it and just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream and yell and fight in their house and it would take me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night but we kind of just got used to it after a while. But one evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep so he very silently woke me up and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. Suddenly, we heard the wooden door just bang, just shot open and some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside, so we both just froze. And then we heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly as if they were trying to get inside, and then they stopped. Luckily, we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get out of the room and lock them in if they came in from the window. Then we just heard my window move and get more opened, and one of the guys saying, something in a different language that we didn't understand and started hearing them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I just shot up out of bed, took my phone, and put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house. So I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms and then the police, who luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything after the police came, I think me and my boyfriend were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, the other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking weed. The police told us that they were inside of their house and found a lot of meth and heroin, and that they were carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was so confused as I've never done anything to offend or do anything wrong to my neighbors, so the idea of them breaking in with whatever knows what intentions with the kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend. The two guys ended up being arrested and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I never heard anything else from the police and I moved back home a few months later. I was 17 when this story happened 3 years ago now. I was working at an old pizza shop right on the edge of my town. For context, the town I was in was an affluent, suburban town surrounded by a bypass which loops around the town. Around my town is some farmland and main roads, where all the blue collar workers moved to after the town was gentrified 10-15 to 15 years back. The pizza shop was around 20 years and was very catered to these same blue collar workers. It's around 9pm and a call comes in for 2 pizzas and a 2 liter of soda. I'm the only driver in, so I have to take the delivery out. It's about a 10 minute drive to get to the location. There I have to drive up a long, gravel driveway that took about 5 minutes to get up. My car really couldn't handle the gravel and how rough it was. Arriving at the place I see a nice house and two barns plotted across the land, with wheat 5-6 to six feet tall surrounding the whole property. Being at this place when I felt truly all alone really started to make my anxiety flare. I decided to call the number on the order because I have no idea where this guy wants me to go and drop off his food. After about another 5 minutes of absolute silence, the man picks up. He had a very deep and raspy voice, like he's been a career smoker, which didn't do anything to help me feel better. I was told to meet him at his truck at the far barn on his property. I am now properly scared as my mind races of all the worst possible things that could happen to me. I pull myself together and muster further into this guy's property. I see the man's truck as I round one of those cylinder storage units where I see his F-150 and him inside. Instead of getting out, I call him and ask him how we should do the transaction. In that same deep voice he instructs me to get out of my car and to put all the food onto his truck bed. Since he paid with his credit card already, I thought this would have been over in 10 seconds. I do what he tells me to do and walk over to the passenger window so that he can sign his receipt. The man looks to be around his mid 40s, heavy set, with a scraggly black beard and a trucker hat. My mind was already racing on being kidnapped or murdered so I really didn't feel safe around this guy. I ask him if he has a pen on him because I forgot to bring one. I was pretty bad at my job 
job and he did not have any cash on him. He stares at me with these cold eyes and points into the back of his truck saying to me, if you ask me for a tip I'm going to be sticking this tip down your throat, where he has a double barrel shotgun just in the back of his car. I'm frozen in fear as I'm registering that this man has just threatened to kill me. The only thing I can muster out is okay and I get back into my car and I get out of that farm. I was going so fast that I screwed up my car from my car bouncing around on that gravel path. I go 80 all the way back to the pizza parlor where I tell my co-workers what happened. None of my co-workers took me seriously and just thought I was playing this up for a joke. I go home and forget about it pretty quickly, but a year later I'm working the lunch shift and the same man calls in and orders a pizza. Now at this point I am refusing to take this order. The pizza place I was working at wasn't doing well business wise, so it's on its last legs already. So management forced me into going anyways. It was only 1 to 2 p.m. on a Sunday, so at least my fear of the dark would be covered. I get there and the man is waiting for me at his actual house. He recognized me and out of all things started apologizing to me for what he said. He was excusing it saying that he just started going through a divorce and was struggling with his emotions. I just wanted the whole thing to be over with and he gave me $60 for what happened. When I was 6 years old, I attended the elementary school which is located in our small town. My way to and from school was basically just 500 meters of main road before turning into the street where I lived. At the time, we're talking about the late 90s here. All the parents in the town were extremely adamant on telling their kids not to trust or follow strangers. Never get into anyone's car, even if they say they know your parents and are friends. The reason why, there was a murder 3 years back in the same town. A girl, not even 6 years old, was found dead in a field. The strange thing about it is, nobody knows how exactly she was taken, no signs of forced entry or anything, which implies somebody lured her somewhere without her suspecting a thing. The case still hasn't been solved more than 20 years later, so our parents were very afraid that their kid was going to be next, because kids can be really stupid and you can't watch them 24-7. Now onto what almost happened to me. I was walking home from elementary school, about halfway home, at the shadiest and mostly covered by trees and bushes area, a car pulled up next to me. A blonde about 30-ish year old woman was the driver. She told me she could drive me home. She claimed to be going in that direction anyway, which was unclear to me at the time. Essentially BS because once the road ends near my house, there is nothing but empty fields. Kid-like as I was, I was not suspicious and was like, oh no, it's not that far, I can walk. Then she started becoming more insistent. The whole, oh come on, it is fine, nothing to worry about, and you can relax instead of walking thing. The alarm bells only started ringing when she said she knew my mother. They are friends and supposedly she was asked by her to drive me home. Thank god for my parents repeatedly talking about the tricks that people use to lure you in. I started being creeped out, continued to walk, but she kept driving beside me. Now the real weird part in hindsight was her next attempt to get me to the car. She started saying that I was obviously afraid and cool children are not afraid of such things. If you want to be cool you should just relax. Honestly, I did not fully realize the full extent of the situation. I just felt uncomfortable and wanted to get out of this conversation so I just started sprinting the rest of my way back to my house. Once I got home, I stayed right next to the door and kept looking out of the window for a few minutes. And guess who drove by and basically checked out the house, that creepy woman. The road was a dead end road, and only after 3 more minutes the car came back the same way. It took years until I realized what kind of bullet I dodged there. All I was thinking was, my parents told me not to do this. I didn't know why or what that woman wanted. The drill of hearing over and over again not to believe strangers or get into their car kicked in. Moral of the story is, even if your kids are too stupid or young, like I was, to comprehend such things, the rules of not following strangers, and the fact that strangers will lie to you for evil intentions, must be drilled into your child's head like watching both ways when crossing the road. Last night, my 25 year old husband woke me up at around 11.50 to tell me that someone has been knocking on our door and ringing our apartment doorbell for about 10 minutes on and off. He woke me so I could possibly ID the person. Once I looked out our upstairs apartment window, I saw the man walking to his car in our apartment parking lot, across the street from our unit. He was wearing blue jeans and a grey t-shirt. He was a medium build, possibly a 30 year old blonde man. He wasn't covering his face or anything, but the thing is, he was carrying what looked like resistance bands or rope. He sat in his car for around 3 minutes while I was on the phone with dispatch. Then he came back to our door and knocked hard for another few minutes. Dispatch advised me that the police were on their way and they hung up. 
I started videoing the vehicle. I read out the tag number and make and model and just watched as he put his car in park in reverse over and over again. Out of seemingly nowhere, he backed out of the parking lot and started rushing away, but not before the officer arrived and pulled him over. My downstairs neighbor knocked on my door and told me that he had been peering into her little children's windows and was pounding on her door as well. She said that her husband had left only one minute before he started knocking at her door. She said he saw her children through the window and that's why he continued knocking. Our doors are right next to one another, so he probably didn't know what door he wanted opened. He was watching us as well through our upstairs windows, so I turned all the lights out and shut the blinds while I called dispatch. The police never contacted us for a statement. I've reached out to dispatch about an update and I'm waiting to see if any action was taken. We're keeping our eyes peeled to see if he's been following us. I'm replacing my porch light bulbs with motion detectors and putting bars in our window and door tracks. My neighbor and our families are panicked to say the least. East. He was outside for about 25 to 30 minutes. Update. I am trained in firearm usage and now live in a state where I can open carry and the background check is really quick. We are going this weekend to get a firearm. My husband will be taking some classes as he came from somewhere where owning a gun is illegal so he's never handled one. I am still waiting on a call from the responding officer. I have his badge number and name so if they don't reach out to me today or tonight he might work third shift I will call the substation. If they didn't do anything I will go ahead and make a suspicious person case for the paper trail. We had no odd encounters last night. However, while I was looking at the video I took, I remember that car. I was walking my dog at 8pm a week ago from him to pee, and this car was driving really slowly through the parking lot and parked a few spots down from where I was letting my dog sniff. They just sat there with the car running. When I tell you my ears started ringing and I got an awful feeling, I'm not joking. I turned around and went home, didn't give my dog the chance to pee, and shut every door window. I think this man has been stalking out our apartment building, me and my neighbors, and I think he wanted to get in where those children are. I'll update more when I have new information. Update 2. It's been a week since the incident. I called the dispatch today because I never received a follow-up from the responding officer. A sergeant from the PD called me back to give me more information. He said that they pulled over the man, ran him to make sure that there were no warrants, and asked him what he was doing. He told the officer that he was meeting up with an acquaintance. The officer let him go with no further questions. I about lost my mind. The sergeant I spoke to today said, stated that he should have looked into it more. It was obviously an attempt at burglary, with whatever knows what intentions. The responding officer is supposed to call me tonight when he gets on duty. I am livid honestly. Zero due diligence for this case, but there's not even a case. No case number, just a documented police contact. I'll give more info when I have it. Final update. The officer finally called me. Here's how the conversation went. I answered groggily. It was well past midnight. Hello miss, I was told you have some questions about an incident a few nights ago. Yes, about Thursday. I wanted to know what the man told you he was doing. You know, he was looking at windows and carrying potential restraints. I'm not sure if that was relayed to you. I stopped him, ran his tags, and he told me that he was meeting up with a guy from a dating app. He seemed forthcoming and open with his motive for being there. Meeting up with Wade. He was meeting up with someone by looking in windows, knocking on two different doors for 20 minutes. I was shocked and still not fully awake. Like I said, he seemed forthcoming and honest with me. With resistance bands, like workout bands, he had lots of belongings in his car, so he just probably had them in there. Right. But bringing them to a hookup, knocking on multiple doors, he saw the little girls through the window. He waited until my neighbor's husband left until knocking. That's on tape, officer. I checked in with the apartment management after the incident. Well, I'm familiar with this individual, and I've been doing drive throughs of your complex to make sure he doesn't come back. I haven't seen anything. If you don't have any more questions, I'll let you go, ma'am. Doesn't make sense to me, but thank you, goodbye, and I hung up. I don't have much to say, I just feel so icky about that conversation. Nothing new has come of the situation. I haven't seen the man or the car. My mind is blown at the lack of follow up or due diligence. I live in a suburb, it's not a busy one either. The PD has a small jurisdiction. Guess I'll have to protect myself. I was 24 at the time, working in a nightclub about a 10 minute walk from my home. I used to close on Tuesday nights slightly earlier than most nights as it was generally our slowest night of the week, closing around 12am instead of keeping customers until 2.30am. Usually I'd be the only one left as I started cutting staff as the night went on and since it was a slower day of the week, we didn't have security on. About 2 months in of regularly closing at 12am, I was walking home. I used to bring bulkier clothes to hide my figure 
when leaving alone as I've been followed and chased multiple times before and we'd often get men waiting after hours for us girls to come out knowing we'd eventually come out after closing and didn't want to attract attention to myself. I also used to walk home as I didn't have a car and had a few terrifying experiences with Uber drivers not actually driving me home, turning out to be fake cabs slash Uber drivers or harassing me until I pretended to show interest or give them some way of contacting me to which Uber would just give me a $5 coupon for the trouble, but that's a story for another time. The bar was located along a main road that was home to the majority of the other bars and restaurants in the city downtown. Often at this time I'd maybe see a handful of people but the streets were generally empty. I'm walking and notice a parked car about a block away. The driver noticed me and U turns around to be on the same side of the street as me. Now he's catcalling me and trying to get me to come into his car. I don't engage and keep walking. We're maybe a block or two past the initial spot I saw him and he's been slowly driving alongside the sidewalk. I'd crossed the street but didn't want to get near his car. He keeps this up until about halfway mark when he takes off in his car and I'm just relieved he's gone. He then comes blasting back down the road. Now my walk has turned into a light jog which then turns me into full on running. I'm running behind closed bars and businesses now trying to find a back route to get home without him seeing where I live. At one point, I'm running through bushes and mud. No matter what street I end up on, his car is waiting for me. Eventually, I run right in front of his car while it's parked on the side street beside my place or run into my house through the back entrance. The back entrance is obscured by plenty of trees and car, and the surrounding houses are multiple unit homes, so I was confident he didn't see what door I got in through. Fast forward to the following Tuesday, and I'm walking home. Guess whose car is parked at the halfway mark? This went on for the next four Tuesdays, except he started parking on the street in front of my house until I begged my manager to take me off closing that specific shift. The last time I saw him, one of the apartment buildings along the way had a few cop cars and cops standing around the entrance and I stayed with them which led them to drive off for the night. A week passes and I'm no longer on that shift. A co-worker of mine sends me a news article via text. I open it and see that the man who's been following me was arrested for doing this to multiple girls in the city along the street my work was on and that I lived on. He got caught because he'd followed a university student up to her house and wouldn't drive away. She called the cops and he was still there by the time they came to arrest him. He got out the next day I believe and was arrested a few more times and was put on restrictions. Couldn't be out of his parents house between certain hours unaccompanied by either parent before he was deported. I've also heard he didn't actually get deported but I moved away shortly after and didn't keep up with the news on him. It was a Wednesday night in the summer. I was off work, my husband was out of town, and our son was staying at his grandma's for the night. I was home alone with my dogs, an 80 pound Aussie mix and my 80 pound German Shepherd slash Pitbull mix. I always have issues sleeping when I'm home alone, so I tend to just binge watch TV in the living room until I can't keep my eyes open anymore. This particular night, I remember that the trash pickup comes the next day. I decided to turn on Game of Thrones for a bit. Then I would take the trash out. All of a sudden, I realize it's 1.30 a.m and I still haven't taken the trash out to the curb. My house has two solid iron gates, one in the front and one to the side door slash backyard. Lighting on our street or anywhere in our neighborhood isn't that great, but it's a quiet neighborhood with a lot of families and you rarely hear about crime here. I looked out the window by habit before I took the trash out and saw who I thought was my neighbor, smoking a cigarette outside of his gate across the street looking directly at me. For context, this is a normal occurrence. My neighbor across the street hides smoking cigarettes from his wife so he typically does it late at night in front of his gate. I get off of work late so I usually see him and we wave, say hi, chat a little, then I go inside and he makes the joke, you didn't see me smoking if my wife asks. So unbothered by seeing the guy, I go outside, grab my trash cans, open my squeaky iron gate and take them out to the curb. I did not have my glasses on at the time, so as usual I waved and said hello. However, the guy, who I thought was my neighbor, threw down the cigarette and quickly walked off down the street. It took a minute for me to register that he was not my neighbor. I was a little creeped out because he was clearly staring into my window from the opposite sidewalk, but also maybe it was a guy taking a night walk. Not unusual in our neighborhood, and just stopped for a cigarette. I thought I probably weirded him out as much as he weirded me out, went back inside and laid on the couch with my dogs to keep watching Game of Thrones. At some point, I fell asleep and I woke up hearing my gate squeak and my German Shepherd mix growling. He's extremely protective of our family at home, but he's also the kind of dog you can take anywhere because he 
he's so friendly in public. My Aussie mix is more passive, but his sheer size and scary bark tends to deter people. He's very friendly though. I quickly got up and pulled back my curtain. My gate was still shut and I didn't see anything. My dog, however, continued to growl at my front door. I looked out another window, which had a better view of my front yard and porch. I didn't see anything. Eventually, my dog settled back down with my other dog, but I was still uneasy. I ended up watching TV again because I couldn't go back to sleep. About an hour later, I definitely heard my gate squeak. We are the only ones with a heavy cast iron gate and the noise it makes is so distinct. So I look out the curtain while my dogs are continuing to softly growl. My gate is halfway open but I don't see anyone. At this point, I'm panicking. In my panic, I couldn't find my phone. I grabbed my wooden baseball bat out of our room, crouched down, and started going through the couch cushions to get my phone. My dogs are oddly still quietly growling instead of barking, so I assumed no one was there. The minute I find my phone, my front door handle starts shaking. I run to the side door to let my German Shepherd mix out. I know he'll protect me and he can jump the 6 foot back gate. My Aussie mix, going crazy, bust out of one of our door side lights. I heard the guys say, oh crap, and immediately, I let out my German Shepherd mix. I jumped up to look out the window, saw my dog latch on the guy's hand, the guy starts screaming and takes off down the street, my dog chasing him. I then become terrified he'll hurt my dog, so I run out with my baseball bat, screaming my dog's name over and over. The next thing I know, my dog is prancing down the street back to me, happy with blood all over his face. I call the police. They took another hour or so to show up and didn't seem to take me too seriously. They said they'd call local hospitals, but I never heard back. I called my husband bawling and he got on the next flight home. I stayed at his mom's for a few days, too terrified to go home. I did buy my dog's giant ribeyes for being so good and saving me. I don't know what that guy wanted, but since then I've been trained in firearms and self-defense. Quick backstory, I have had a stalker for about 4 years. He was never aggressive or sent me proper threats, so stubborn as I am, I did my best to ignore him and not give him the satisfaction of showing him any fear. His stalking behavior mostly just consisted of sending me letters and gifts, such as photos of my own apartment building from the outside, things he dug out of my trash can and so on. I called the police many times but they weren't able to or really tried to be honest, catch or identify him. About 3 weeks ago, I discovered the AITA subreddit and thought that people might want to know about what it's like to have a stalker. Since I barely use any social media aside from reddit and have no personally identifying information here, I didn't think he'd ever see it. One person even asked, does he know you're putting him on blast on reddit? And I answered, maybe. Maybe it would make him angry, maybe he'd be turned on. Don't know, don't care. Well, I know the real answer now. He did see it and he did not like it. Like I said, he was never aggressive and never came close to me. The closest I know of was when he sent me a picture of myself. Unlocking my apartment door, take it from the corner of the steps above. I'm thinking that he might have hit a camera there instead of being there to take the photo himself. I think I would have noticed him if he did. I don't know how he got wind of the AITA post I made, but he did. The next week was quiet, no letters, and I didn't see him anywhere. Then, he left me letters with printed out questions and my answers from the AITA post. He also left me with a long, hateful letter towards my boyfriend about an issue I had posted on the AITA subreddit. His letters were never hateful like that before, though he never seemed happy with my boyfriend. He wrote about how I should share the spotlight with him since I got so much attention thanks to him. A few days later, I got a gift, but this time he didn't leave it in my mailbox or at my car like he usually did. No, this time he left it inside the apartment building right in front of my door. I didn't take it inside my apartment but opened it outside. It was a pretty big box, which was also unusual, and it was taped shut. As I'm typing it out now, I realized that wasn't a good idea at all and could have ended badly for me. But luckily, he didn't send me anything deadly or anything. He did however send me several zip ties, a roll of tape, the kind you use to tape off walls when painting, nothing you could use to restrain someone, a TV remote with most buttons picked off, a pack of band-aids with a few used ones, not actually, just made to look that way according to the police, and a framed picture of me. I could tell the picture was taken a few days ago and my boyfriend was next to me but cut out of the photo. The frame was shattered and the package was full of glass shards, clearly more than just what could have fallen out of the frame and they were also intentionally put inside the crumbled newspaper that was stuffed in there to keep it all in place. I called the police right away and gave it to them. They were more concerned this time, finally, thanks. It told me they'd send patrol cars more frequently. 
he didn't show up or leave me any letters or gifts for about another week and a half. But eight days ago, it started again. I found letters in my mailbox where he wrote about how he wasted his time on me, how I haven't been appreciating his effort, how he was wrong about me being special. Five days ago, I left my apartment in the morning and heard a crunch sound as I stepped onto my doormat. He put broken glass under it in the night. I went off to work because I was in a hurry and was just going to make my boyfriend call the police, but then I found my car had also been vandalized. The sides were scratched, lights smashed, and the windshield had a phrase painted on. It's time soon, miss, my last name. I went back inside and called the cops myself. They found the same phrase on a note under the doormat. This time, they really, really, really took me seriously, which might have been because I was just pissed at this point, which I made very clear. All of this, the letters, gifts, photos, even the glass under my doormat, are just really annoying and inconvenient. But my car was useless to me now and the threat scared me even more. I did, however, have a dash cam in my car, and it caught everything. The police said they took the footage as evidence, even though the dash cam footage wasn't of high quality, and I had given them photos of him that were just as good before, but they said it's not enough. And they told me they'll look into it further and promise to send more patrol cars again. Then it was quiet for two more days. Until two days ago, someone rang the doorbell at just after 4am. My boyfriend and I got up, but we were both hesitant, but I saw the blue lights outside, and just as I got up, I heard them shouting, this is the police, please open the door. They told us they were called by one of our downstairs neighbors, who came home from his night shift after about an hour earlier, and heard someone else entering the building after them before their door fell shut. My neighbors know of my situation, and I've asked them to make sure they don't let strangers into the building. This neighbor then went into his own apartment and looked through the peephole. We have motion activated lights in the stairway, so he waited to see if they had turned back on. They did. Then he saw a middle aged man walk upstairs. Above this neighbor are only me and my boyfriend, and a single mom with three kids who probably won't be getting any visitors at 3 a.m., so he called the police. They came and found my stalker one half floor above me on the stairs. He should have been able to see the cop car since there was a little window up there and they had their lights on, but he either missed them or wanted to get caught. They found a pocket knife on him and he confessed to being my stalker right away. He's finally caught. They got him. It took four years and one very vigilant and caring neighbor, but he's finally done. He's facing several charges and I've collected every single piece of evidence over the past four years. I don't know what kind of outcome I can expect, but for now, I finally got some peace. When I was a kid, my mom worked as a teacher and she was very close to a co-worker of hers who had a son around my age and of whom I, as well, was very close. When my mom or her friend would head out for the night, the other would take care of both of us kids and basically, it meant I spent half of my time over there and my friend spent half of his time at my house, which was perfect and fun for us. We lived in different cities, but since that kind of system had been going on pretty much forever since, I grew up knowing my friend's city just as well as mine. His mom was well aware of that. So so that being said, whenever we were going on a walk in their area, she let us wander around because she knew we'd always find our way back to her. My mom though was more cautious and always kept an eye on us, as she'd walk behind us to make sure she always was able to see us. I just wish her friend would have done the same. One day, I had to be around 6 or 7, we were going on a walk with my friend Marcus and his mom Katie. It was a very sunny day and I was wearing a dress with embroidered flowers and I had my blonde long hair down. During that walk, Katie was walking ahead of us and I was chatting and just fooling around with Marcus when he suddenly remembered something urgent to tell his mom. As urgent as something can be for an 8 year old boy. He ran up to her and left me strolling behind for a couple of minutes just as it already had happened a hundred times prior. That time though we were circling around a big camping site and we walked by the white vans and camping cars. One of those vans had its back doors open and there was a man, probably in his mid 40s, smoking a cigarette and leaning on the vehicle. He locked eyes with me as I was approaching, then saw that Katie and Marcus weren't paying much attention to me as they were already a couple of meters ahead. Then he proceeded to pull me by my arm close to him and so I found myself with my body touching his. So weirded out that I didn't even say a word, although I knew Katie would have heard me if I called for help. He leaned toward me as he was obviously much taller than I was, muttering something I didn't get and he winked at me and kissed me on the lips and then pulled me to the open doors of his van. At this point, if he had pushed me just a little, I would have fell in the truck. At this point, I was just too scared to even lift a finger and even though I didn't understand everything that was going on, I knew it wasn't okay. He put his hands on the door as to close the vehicle and I felt my heart sink. At that exact moment, some other man jogged towards us, in his 40s as well, waving hello to me and saying something along the lines of, I lost 
lost sight of you for a bit. I was so scared. He had a very friendly look on his face and was staring at me with a great insistence and with a huge reassuring smile. And the van man awkwardly laughed and yanked me out of the way of the car, slamming the door shut. I ran to Katie as I heard the van go off and just acted as if nothing had happened. To this day, I never told that story to anyone, not to Katie or Marcus. Not to my mom, nobody. I am 22 years old today. Last year, I was staying in a university hall for my final year. It's a private building so not connected to the university and out in the city near the main town. We have a car park but nobody really uses it because we are poor students and it costs money to park there so mine was one of the only two or three cars at a given time. The car park isn't well lit and it's to the side of the building so you have to walk for about two or three minutes to get into the main door. I was sitting in my car one evening after getting back from the gym, just scrolling on my phone because my seat was warm and it was dark and raining outside so I couldn't be bothered to get up yet. I was reading an article when suddenly someone started knocking on my window which was really odd. It was a man dressed all in black and he started telling me how his friend had seen me through the window and thought I was really attractive so could he have my number. I responded no that's a bit odd and I don't feel comfortable with it. He continued to be insistent for a while practically begging me to get out and give them my number or any social media details telling me I should come over and speak to his friend who was weirdly stood at the other side of the car park for the away from the building. I kept saying no and scrolling on my phone to show that I wasn't interested. He finally relented and walked away. I text one of my friends to ask if he'd come and get me and walk with me to the building. As I was waiting, this man returned but now with his hood up and he started banging loudly on my window, saying that I was being rude, ungrateful, calling me all kinds of names. I kept staring at my phone and pretending I couldn't hear him. He then started trying my door handle. Thankfully, I locked my car after the first encounter and then began violently pushing into my car when it didn't work. I still kept ignoring him and text for my friend to probably bring some other friends with him. My friend was taking a long time to read my message and I was terrified but for some reason didn't think to call the police, probably because I was scared of things escalating. The guy at my window had calmed down after a few minutes and walked off, saying that he'd leave me alone now. However, I watched him out of the corner of my eye join up with his friend and then maybe three or four other men. They walked so they were out of sight, but I could see their shadows lingering as they kind of circled around my car and moved towards the building but staying in the dark. They lingered there for for a while until luckily another car came which was obviously full of students going to a party due to the loud music and singing going on inside. This group of men left as they saw these people arrive and I latched onto them and was able to walk with them as they entered the building. When I got home, my friend finally responded. He said that he'd actually heard about these guys before. Apparently they'd followed another girl into the building and into the lift a couple of days prior, then stood in the lift making really gross comments to her. She had to run to her door and lock it, where they then stood outside knocking on the door and whispering for her to open it. We were able to report this to the building who, to their credit, then hired a permanent set of security staff. We also got the CCTV footage of both incidents and were able to pass this on to the police. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. My mom's dog, Punky, was a very sweet loving dog. She was an ESA dog but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she lived. She never growled or nipped anyone and she had no sense of smell so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terriers at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here was that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only saw it once. I, 11 years old, was at home with my siblings, 2 years old and 6 years old. My then stepdad is at work and my mom ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a 2 bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, on a dead end road at the time, and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down our rickety driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer, having a grand time watching YouTube videos, when all of a sudden all of our dogs, about 2 Boston terriers and one chihuahua perk up, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figured they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur standing on end, her tail straight up, and then she barks. Loudly, I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off of the couch and goes tearing down the hallway. I'm already on edge because I don't think I've 
I've ever heard her bark, ever. She's a Basenji mix, so her bark is more of a bane sound, but this was a big, loud, alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it. Knock, knock, knock. We didn't get visitors because of how weird our house was location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up here were family, and they didn't knock, so I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the intention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky, and I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were all the size of New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly. He was a really thin, taller man with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes, and this half-managed hair, sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin, a little too shallow, and his clothes were all off too. They were nice, but fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer looking t-shirt and new jeans, but he had what looked like a suit jacket on. All his clothes were dark too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas, and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up and taped over. I stare up at him in confusion because I definitely don't know this man, and I asked him what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that's way too fake, like this exaggerated and forced grin, and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Hey there kiddo, I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner, and he shakes the bottle at me. Mind if I come in to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head because he just seems so off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is unnerving, because he probably knew they weren't and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, that I'd have to go get my mom, something except what I did say, but I didn't. Instead, I just shook my head and said, no, we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things, and he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out and think to close the door, but the thing is, our front door didn't even lock. Small town, hard to access home, we never needed a lock, so that's basically useless. I'm sure there's something very wrong about to happen, and I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think I have before it does happen, when all of a sudden I hear it. Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground with her teeth barred and snarling like she was feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth, her ears were down and she was ready to pounce. The guy hears it too, and as I look towards Punky, she tries to lunge past me, and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word, booking it down the driveway as I let Punky out along with the rest of our dogs and they start chasing him. Our small dogs chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about, but Punky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just staring in the distance until he disappears. I swear I saw someone jump up with him running when he got onto the road. The second he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog I knew. No barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realized my siblings are still down the hall and run to check on them, and when I get to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still. But the bedroom window was wide open, the curtains pushed all to one side and the items on the dresser in front of the window all shoved around. Someone had tried to climb through the window, no doubt my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch, where Punky was sleeping. So I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off, and the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mom inside while our small dogs were the ones that saw public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home, she took all of us to my aunt's house, and on our way there, we saw the men walking up someone else's driveway. Men plural, because we watched a second one split off to wait by the road. In 2014, I moved to England from Canada to gain work slash travel experience and also to find myself. I ended up living in Essex with three other roommates. They were all women, all a bit older than I was. I was 24 at the time, Megan was 31, Cherry was 34, and Cassie was 38. Megan was from New York, Cherry from New Jersey, and Cassie from Poland. All four of us shared this three-story flat. The back of our home was the living room and the kitchen. The back wall was complete glass that looked out into the garden, and the garden was complete 
completely fenced in. The house had an interesting dynamic to say the least. Tons of stories from that time in my life. I adored all of my roommates except for Cherry. After living with Cherry for 7 months, I was over her antics. One day, I come home from work, I lock the door, make myself something to eat, and go up to bed. I brought some work home with me, so I am in my night tight with all these papers around me and my headphones on jamming out. I had headphones on because Cherry was out to dinner with work friends. That meant booze and then soon after that a tantrum was surely to come. I just didn't want to have to listen to her crazy scream crying. I am working away, completely focused until I feel something. I look up to see a man standing over me. I don't register it right away and passively say, Cherry's room in on the second floor, and continue to work. Cherry regularly brought strange men home. He doesn't leave. Again, Cherry's room is downstairs you, he then interrupts. I am not here for Cherry. A cold chill iced my veins. My fight or flight kicked in just then. I start surveying the situation. I look him up and down. He has a bottle of Prosecco in one hand and a knife in the other. He is about 5'10", wild muddy brown hair and black eyes. He has a light blue polo shirt on and one side of his collar is popped up in a distinct Manchester accent. Once I focused in, I realized his eyes were black because his pupils were completely dilated. I was in trouble. I needed an escape plan. Unfortunately, this man was standing in between me and my bedroom door. I needed to get downstairs, but I needed for him to think it was his idea. I decided to play along. Just then, he uses his knife to pop the cork. Prosecco started flowing onto my carpet. I said, oh no, let's clean that up. I prefer to drink out of a proper bottle anyways. He nodded replying, yeah, let's go. Go. I try to act as natural as possible. I try not to show that I am shaking all over and try to gain control of my breathing. We take the long journey down to the main floor of my flat, all three floors. He has the back of my night tie bunched up in one hand and I could feel the point of the knife graze my back with his other. I was trying to playfully speak with him as we walked down the stairs. I couldn't tell you what I was saying, I was most likely rambling, I couldn't hear anything over my heart beating in my ears. We get to the bottom of the stairs and there is a hallway to my left that leads to the front door. On my right, which is much closer to us is the kitchen and living room. We make our way into the kitchen. I point to the cabinets that had the wine glasses. He said he knew where they were and started walking towards them. I now have the kitchen table in between us. It was time to run. I burst into a sprint down the hallway towards the door. My hands fumble over the lock, shaking and sweating. I swing open the door and see two men walking across the street. They must have been walking home from the train. There was a big train station in front of our home. I call out to them for help and suddenly I am flung onto the ground. Little pebbles piercing my skin and sent sharp pains where they are jabbed. The intruder pushed me out of the way to run and escape. One of the men chased after the intruder while the other said for me to go inside while he surveyed my home and to call the police. I locked the doors and I called the police. While I am on the phone with dispatch, I manically run around the house to double check all the windows and doors. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang on my door. I inform the dispatch of the banging and she informs me that the police weren't there yet. I thought it might be one of the gentlemen who helped me. I go to look out the eye hole and it's him, the intruder. He came back. He's banging on my door screaming that I had his glasses and that he was not done with me. I absolutely freak out. The dispatcher attempts to calm me down, but I am losing my ever-loving mind. She then said, They are pulling onto your street now. You should hear their sirens. I did. The intruder then blasts off. One officer jumps out of the passenger side while the car is still moving and chases after him. The second officer comes into my home, interviews me, and the two gentlemen collects evidence, takes photos. The next morning, I am called in to identify a man they had in custody. I pointed him out. I go into a little room and the officer pulls out an evidence bag. He asked me if the items were mine. They were. They were my underwear and photos taken from my home. The officer informed me that the intruder had been stalking me for some time now. He estimates three months. He had made a nest outside our home on top of a hill that overlooked into our living room and kitchen. He is a known offender and drug dealer. He then told me how lucky I was to get out practically unharmed. Others weren't so lucky. So this happened in 2011, so the exact dialogue may have escaped my memory a bit, but the situation is something I'll never forget. Also, AIM was still pretty active during this time and so was video chatting. Thank Tiny Chat. This is important for later. I was on an online dating site and was talking to this guy. I was 31 at the time and he was 28. We talked for about 6 weeks before I gave him my phone number and we took it offline to calling and texting for another couple of weeks. 2 months after our initial chat, we were texting and he told me that he was out having a few 
beers at a bar near my house. He asked what I was doing and asked if I wanted to come out but I had a very long day at work and didn't feel like going to a bar. I'm also not a big drinker. I invited him over to my place, I know, after he finished at the bar and he accepted. I figured I would be okay since I do keep firearms for protection and know how to defend myself, if needed. I also had a webcam. I took a shower so I wouldn't smell like a water buffalo in a hot day. The air went out at work, put on some makeup and got dressed to wait. He then called and said he was outside of my house. I clicked record on my computer's webcam program and turned off my monitor and went to let him in. It's around 10pm and he comes in and we go back to my bedroom because my living room was being remodeled. We're sitting on the bed chatting for about an hour, talking about everything under the sun. The conversation flowed. He was very handsome and so easy to be comfortable with. We got on the subject of firearms and I showed him mine. About 15 minutes later he asked for some water so I go to the kitchen to get him a bottle. When I came back he said he got a phone call and had to leave. After he left I looked on my nightstand where I put the firearm down after showing him and noticed that it was gone. I looked everywhere for it thinking I had put it down somewhere else. Nope not there. I then played back the recording from my webcam program and sure enough it shows him grabbing it and putting it in his hoodie. I was terrified at that point. He knew where I lived. He had my firearm and he left his phone on my bed. Right then his phone rings and I answer it. Come to find out he's married. His wife was calling him wondering where he was. I told her everything including the fact that he stole my firearm and I had video evidence and was calling the police on him. Next thing I know he's banging on my door, my firearm in his hand asking me for his phone. The conversation went like this. Him, I need my phone. Give me my phone. Me, not opening the door but yelling through the window. Take the clip out of my firearm, empty the chamber, throw the clip into the bushes. The one in the chamber across the road and put it on the ground. Him, no, give me my phone. Me, I'm on the phone with your wife at the moment and I have you on video stealing from me. I put his wife on speaker. Wife. A whole bunch of expletives. Him, he runs and gets in his car and then comes back. I threw your gun in the ditch. At this point, I make him empty his pockets, take his pants off, take his hoodie off and show me that he doesn't have my firearm on him. All the while, his wife is on the phone. I go outside and get in his car in the driver's seat and tell him to take me to where he threw my firearm. He proceeds to tell me that I don't know how hard it is for him, being a felon, not being allowed to own a firearm ever because of a mistake he made. The mistake, domestic violence involving a firearm. We get up the road, he tells me that the firearm is there in the ditch. Then I realize the situation I'm in. I can get out of the car and go get it, leaving him to do whatever to me if he chose. I could make him go get it, taking a chance of him seriously hurting me. I took that chance since I was on his phone with his wife and my phone with 911. He retrieves my firearm, brings it back to the car and I drive back to my house and wait on the police. I get out of the car and he gets in the driver's seat. I'm still on the phone with the police. I walk around the back of his car to get his license plate number and he just puts his car in reverse, hits me and takes off. They found him later that evening. He still had the clip and the one in the chamber in his pocket so now he's enjoying some time in prison. So glad I never have to meet this person again. This takes place around 10 years ago when I was like 8 or 9. I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood in what was at the time a really rundown city. It wasn't good but it wasn't bad at the same time, just a few bad apples in the tree. Anyways, enough background on the neighborhood and now to the main story. My friends and I loved to play outside, it was the only thing we could do. No one in the neighborhood could afford any sort of electronics or any sort of fun machine to play with. We loved to just run through people's yards, cutting through houses if they just so happened to leave their door open. Now looking back on it, it is probably the dumbest thing kids our age could have been doing in a neighborhood like that. This story has nothing to do with running in people's houses. Just wanted to let you know how dumb of kids we were. Well, on one fateful day, we were playing hide and seek with four of us hiders and one of us a seeker. We thought it would have been a funny idea to go to the other side of the neighborhood so that the seeker could never find us and we'd win. We like to call that part of the neighborhood the rich part because they had two story houses over there and a forest with a creek in it. We were just doing our usual thing, cutting through people's yards and jumping fences when we heard the loudest scream maybe four to five houses down. After hopping off the fence that we had just jumped, we all stopped and looked around wondering where it came from. I noticed that one of our hiders weren't with us anymore. Three of us left. Where's Isaac? I exclaimed. We heard the scream again. I pointed towards where the sound came from and we all jumped back over the fence we just jumped from and ran towards the scream. When we thought we got to the spot where the screaming was coming from, there was nothing there but an empty plot of land in the forest. We all started to get scared. Did Isaac get 
get lost in the forest? Did he get taken back there? Then we heard the scream again. It was definitely Isaac. I decided to be the man of all the other 8 year olds and go into the forest to make sure Isaac was okay. As I started my way into the trees, I did one last look at my friends and saw how horrified their faces were. I knew at that moment that I was definitely the only one that would go down into the forest. Making my way in, I could feel all the heat in my body fading and some sort of dread starting to take over. As I walked further in, it started getting darker and harder to see. I was whispered yelling my friend's name. He responded in the most shaken up voice, down here, be quiet. I finally got to him and asked him what happened. He told me the story of how he got tired of running and decided to take a break on the curb to catch his breath and that instead of being out in the open and risking the chance of being caught, he decided to go into the woods and hide. He said that after like 5 minutes after he sat down, he heard talking. Nothing that he could make out, just random nonsense. He looked around to see a man in a black hoodie hiding behind a tree on the other side of the creek staring at him, but the man took off before my friend could even get up to run away. And this is where he said he started screaming at the top of his lungs and hid somewhere else in the forest, which is where both of us are now hiding. And I kid you not, as soon as he told me this, we heard a twig snap. We both look up to see the man looking for us in some of the shrubbery on the forest floor. I couldn't make out any facial expressions or anything on his face for a matter of fact. I could see he was holding some sort of blade. I couldn't tell if it was a stick or a machete. All I knew is that we needed to run. So when he turned us back, we got up and started running. We didn't care how loud we were, we just knew that we needed to run. We got out of the forest and told all of our friends to run as fast as they could down the street. We kept running until we got to the other side of the block and we all turned around to see the street empty. No one, not a single car, and from a distance you could hear a roar, or like a very loud engine. Shortly after that initial roar, a silver 2000s Mustang with the darkest windows comes peeling around the corner faster than I've ever seen a car go, headed straight towards us. I've never had my body tighten up like that at that very moment when I knew it was the same guy from the forest. I told all of my friends to split up and run into people's yards to hide. So as we were all hiding and running through alleyways and jumping fences, you could still hear his engine. It was like he was targeting only me. I can't even tell you how far I ran. I got to the point where I didn't even think I was in my neighborhood, but still I hear his engine coming up on me. So I ran more. I was exhausted. The sun finally started to set and I could hear his engine fade. Almost like he had forgotten about me or had just given up. I start making my way back home scared, checking my back every so often to make sure I wasn't being followed. Once I made it home, I went right to bed to cry myself to sleep. And for months after that, that 2000 silver Mustang would follow us, stalking every corner that we played on. We would see it at our school and the grocery store. It could have been a coincidence that our little minds are not perceiving things around us, but either way, I think he was stalking us. Nothing actually came of him following us. He never did what he did that first day, but it was still so scary seeing that car everywhere we went. I didn't know what to do or how to tell my mom, so I didn't, and still haven't. This story's for the people of this sub and my four other friends. Funny enough, the seeker didn't know what happened until the day after we were at school and we told him. He still doesn't believe us and says it was to go inside and have him looking for us all night. So for a bit of context, I am a college student. Without giving too many details, I am a woman on the smaller side of average female height. I currently do not have a car, so I use my bike, walking, and the bus to get around. My college has a transit service that allows you to scan in with a student boarding pass for free. Other non-students are allowed to ride the bus by paying upon entering or purchasing a ticket beforehand. I frequently ride the bus for various reasons, grocery runs, or treating myself to food. And yesterday, I had the idea of treating myself to a movie after after all the exams I have been having lately. I'm an avid horror fan and knew that Terrifier 2 was in theaters, so of course I wanted to see it immediately. One of my friends told me they found it funny and really enjoyed it, which was more than enough reason to go see it. I was looking at tickets the day before yesterday and trying to decide which time slot I wanted to see the movie in. Looking back now, something in my gut told me to choose the earlier time, I wish I had listened. Another detail I want to add is that there are two bus sizes, a large one and a small one. The bus I rode during the incident was the smaller one. The stop where I got on the bus is the beginning of the route. Unlike every other stop, the driver usually parks the bus here for 5 minutes and gets off to use the restroom or have a quick break before continuing with the rest of the route. Upon entering the bus, I noticed only two other passengers, another girl about my age and an older man. The girl was in the front of the bus on the right side and the man was in the second row on the left side. I sat on the right side, several rows back. I usually read something on my phone or listened to music on the bus, so I immediately got on my phone when I sat down. Everything was 
okay for a little bit until I looked up and noticed the man repeatedly staring at me and looking away before staring at me again. I was immediately apprehensive but just brushed it off. He started speaking aloud out of nowhere saying things like, beautiful baby and so fine, while staring at me. I was frozen out of fear and could only keep looking at my phone and trying to ignore it. This continued until I worked up the courage to say, sir would you please stop staring at me? To which he claimed he was not staring and told me I was extremely beautiful. Unsure of what to say I just stupidly thanked him and went back to my phone. He had his body slightly turned but when I confronted him he faced fully forward. The driver got back on and we started moving again so everything was calm for a bit. Though I was admittedly still shaken up. This calm did not last long. Obviously this creep couldn't contain himself and just had a voice's opinions about me out loud. He started saying similar things again but also added some new phrases such as gonna make you my wife and by far the worst one I'm gonna get you pregnant. I was shaking at this point and was unsure what to do. I desperately wanted to sit next to the other girl but did not want to pass by him to sit by her. We made it to the other two stops before the girl got off and said sorry before leaving. My heart dropped to my stomach. The last thing I wanted was to be alone with this guy. Luckily more people got on at the stop. A middle aged couple and a guy about my age. In a panicked voice I sort of shouted and asked the guy my age if he would sit with me. He was a bit confused but came to sit by me and I immediately felt relief. The stress of the situation got to me and I broke down crying. I guess the creep took this as indication to leave because he swiftly made his exit after that. The kind younger guy who sat next to me and began to comfort me. I am so grateful he chose to ride the bus that day. The bus driver noticed the commotion and called me to the front to get information in order to make a report. He told me he couldn't hear anything but that buses have video and it would hopefully pick up what the creep was saying. He told me that the same man had recently been kicked off for a similar incident and that he would be reporting this immediately. For the rest of the ride, the younger guy and I talked about things like majors and other school related stuff. I want to go into the marine biology field and he is a graduate student in mechanical engineering. I made it to the movies, it was awesome, and back home safely. But I definitely learned a lesson. My boyfriend is going to help me look into some self defense items and he taught me a few fighting tactics. This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me as no one ever used that door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time and all the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't make sense to use the back entrance and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door, I saw two tall men in the window standing at the door. I did not feel safe opening the door so I called out hello. One of the men tapped on the window. Yes hello, may we come in? We are with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for cable but did not have any issues with it. I replied, we're not having any issues with Bresnan, is there a problem? Ma'am, the man said, can we come in? We're servicing the area and it's important we look at your cable. I shook my head, we're not having any issues, I repeated, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we are visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the doorknob and tried to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey shakiness in my voice. So you don't need to be here. The two figures appeared to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work. I gripped the knife tighter. Ma'am, I saw him try the doorknob again. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Could I please get your names and badge numbers? I can give your supervisor a call to let them know our cable is fine. I heard another shuffle and one of the men replied, no need to ma'am, we're sorry we wasted your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he came home. He immediately called the Bresnan cable company and spoke to a representative, who informed us that no one from their company was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company no one had. For the longest time, there was this man that would sit in his garage and watch me. He was an older man and he was very scrawny. He had patchy gray hair and a super gross beard. I never learned his name, so we'll call him Nick. He looked like a Nick to me. I moved into my classic suburban home before I was even born. I've been living here my whole life, and the first memory I have of Nick was when I was 10 and he gave me a small two-finger wave as I walked back home after school. I had to see him every day since my bus stop was a few houses down and I walked like a block to get home. My mom said he dropped by after 
after I was born, knocked on the door in the middle of the day and rang the doorbell until someone answered. My mom finally answered, my one year old brother attached to her leg and newborn me in her arms. She said his face lit up when he saw me. He smiled brightly and asked to hold me. She obviously denied, cause who comes to your house to hold your child when you don't know them in the slightest? She said he scowled at her before calmly walking back to sit in his garage to smoke a cigar. After my first encounter with Nick, I never stopped seeing him. Every day after school, every morning before school, every time I took my dogs out for a walk, every time I peeked out of my window at 3am. I swear this guy never slept. I told my brother how it freaked me out and he said he was probably on house arrest and that was the only way he could get out. We learned that wasn't true when he knocked on our door. Small background for this bit, my mom is very weak. She has an autoimmune disease and her legs and feet will go numb randomly. She's doing a lot better now but this event happened when she was pretty bad. She insisted she take the dogs out alone and I didn't want to argue so I sat in the living room. After about a minute I hear a knock. I yell out that the door is unlocked thinking it's my mom but there's a louder knock. I get up and go to the door. I open it and there he is smiling at me. Hey hun, your mom fell off the porch. You might want to help her. Nick states giving me goosebumps. His voice was unreal. So raspy and sounded like he was in the process of choking. He leaves very quickly and I hurry to help my mom off the grass. Calling on my younger brother to get the two dogs inside. I gave her the I told you so speech and she grumbled about it for weeks. My younger dog, a pit bull made of 98% muscle, got excited when she saw a bird. She pulled to get the bird and yanked my mom off the porch. She was standing behind a pot and tripped over it on her way down, making the fall hurt a lot more. She had a black eye and her legs were scratched up. The pot of flowers that she tripped over was smashed, but she was okay otherwise. Flash forward to my 13th birthday and my mom's in the hospital, so my dad goes all out, letting me invite a lot of my friends over for a sleepover, making us dinner and breakfast and just letting me have an amazing time. There's a park across from my suburb that I walk over to sometimes. I decided that I wanted to take my friends there to chill before their parents picked them up. The night before we were looking out the window and giggling about the man, I know it's creepy and we were 13, so they knew he was weird. I told them to ignore him if he talked to them, but I didn't take my own advice. Hey Rosie, he said it so quietly I barely heard him. My name is Rose and Rosie is a nickname my grandfather often used. I never told this guy my name, neither did any of my family members. Uh, hi, I replied and my friends all scowled at me, knowing I screwed up. How's your mom? She's fine. I go to leave before I pause. How do you know my name? You told me, remember? No, I don't, because it didn't happen, but I wanted to get away, so I agreed. Oh, right, I chuckle. Me and my friends scurry off to the park. The next day, there's a box of chocolates sitting on the porch, a note with Rosie and Chicken Scratch writing on top of it. I pick it up and look over at the guy. He waves, and I can see that his left hand has disappeared into his pants. Gross. I leave the box out there and tell my dad. The next morning, me and my dad take our dogs out. No man. I figured he gave up after he saw me reject his chocolates. A few weeks later, a large family moves into the house, and I hadn't seen a trace of the man until yesterday. I'm 15 now, and the woman who lives in the guy's house comes over yesterday. Does a Rosie live here, she asks. I had answered the door and my heart drops at the nickname from the stranger. Yeah, why? She hands me an envelope with my full name written on it. The guy who lived in the house before us said to give Rosie this on her birthday. It's not Rosie's birthday. I was trying to pretend I'm not Rosie. Oh, well, I just took a guess. He didn't give us a date. Have a good day. My dad opened the envelope wearing a mask because I quote, what if he filled it with cocaine? The note inside just said, I love you in his writing, red ink, my favorite color. I was about 5 or 6. I went to my local kindergarten and I was as carefree as a child can be. The greatest of my worries being if my mom forgets to pick me up from school. She never does and every day we walk from school to home and vice versa since it was a good walking distance. We lived in a compound that's kind of secluded and mostly inhabited by old people or boarding students who went to the university near it. This morning started out like any other. My mom picks me up and we're walking along the small path in our compound along with four other people, three high schoolers, two of which were walking together and a female college student. She was holding a handkerchief over her head because of the heat. The sun was high up and glaring in the middle of the day that you wouldn't expect anything to happen, but it did. We were quite far back from this group when I turn around and see a man join us. He's clearly not from there. He had a bright neon green bag in front of him which was slightly opened, one of his hands inside of it. His clothes were kind of dusty but most of all he was glaring at us. It was just us five walking in this quiet compound and my little self didn't think much of it. Up until my mom squeezed my hand and started speed walking. At first I was confused, but I knew the only thing that could trigger this was that there was a danger behind us, and it came in the form of the stranger that was following us closely behind. I kept looking back discreetly, although it was probably obvious, and still he kept staring at all of us, getting closer and closer. I looked up at my mom trying to ask what was going on, but her low murmurs didn't really translate well for me, except my ears picking up on the word knife. 
That's when I felt my stomach drop. My stupid little legs weren't fast enough. Factor in my mom's older age, she was around 50, compared to our other companions. We were the easy target. We were pretty much at the back, but our house was near and I focused on that. Because if I thought about the threat behind us, my legs would feel like jelly and I'd end up slowing down. Still, I couldn't resist looking back. He just kept getting closer and closer, shortening the distance between us. I remember thinking about how I wanted to scream for help, desperately looking at these houses that seemed empty, wanting to go inside, but my mom's firm grip kept me going. Anyways, we lived here too. I never really knew if the others were aware of it, not much until later. One of the high schoolers left to a house over the basketball court and further down the path, the path veered off to a different trail that led to the main highway. So it was just us and the female college student, Goody. At this point, the man was also speed walking and catching up, but our apartment was merely a few steps away and my mom and I dashed towards it, up the stairs and into the comfort of our own home. The man gave us one last glare, but he continued to walk. My heart was pounding against my chest. My mom had left me to lock the door while she stared out the window. She kept repeating, he has a knife, I saw it. He's holding a knife. I run towards the window and catch a glimpse of the girl, still clutching that handkerchief above her head, looking behind her in fear and alarm as the man continued to follow her, his bright neon bag in front of him, now wide open, his hand still inside, as he kept getting closer and closer. I don't really know what happened after, only of my mom's recollection of the events. She had noticed the man suddenly come up behind us too, and her suspicions were raised when he didn't try to walk past us like the others, but made maintain a close distance between us. And then she saw the knife, hidden in his bag, holding on to it as he stared at us. I hope that girl's okay, and that man was detained or something, but it's been years now and I don't really know what happened to her. Don't really know if I'd like to. This happened about 5 years ago. I was around 16 to 17 years old. I always enjoyed walking. I would spend at least 1 hour a day walking the roads around where I lived. One day I was out doing my normal route, walking down my street that my house was on, taking a right out to the main street, and following it until I got to the end. There I would cross the crosswalk and retrace my steps to go home. On this particular day, I was about 20 feet from where I would leave the main road on my journey back home. I had my headphones in, blasting music as always, which can be a bad habit as I I was young walking alone, but since it was daylight and the roads were pretty busy, I figured I was safe. But man, was I ever off with that assumption. As I was about to pass the entrance of a side street before leaving this main road, a black Ford F-150 pulled up. He stopped and gestures for me to walk in front of him, so I do so. I was about to go on my merry way when I barely heard someone trying to talk to me. I turned down my music, taking out my headphones as I looked to see the man in the black Ford still stopped at the entrance of the side road. I looked at him puzzled trying to figure out if he was talking to me. I pointed at myself and he grinned nodding. What's a beautiful girl like you doing out here, he asked. I laughed awkwardly. Uh, walking, I replied, seen as the answer should have been obvious. It's a beautiful day for that, he commented, just seeming to make small talk. Yeah, I stated before going to turn around and continue my route home. Wait, the man called. I stopped and turned around, just trying to be polite. Even though the encounter was odd, I didn't see too many red flags yet. The man continued to compliment me. I grew incredibly uncomfortable at this point, seen as this man had to be in his mid-40s. He had a bit of a receding hairline with black hair, a nose with a protruding bridge, blue eyes that were surrounded by slight wrinkles and it was dressed in a dress shirt so I instantly brought up my age I was hoping saying this would get this fully grown adult man to back off but he didn't oh that's okay come on sweetheart get in the truck that's when I started panicking red flags shooting up everywhere stranger danger I laughed nervously looking at the cars around me to see if anyone was noticing what was happening nobody did no that's fine my house isn't far no really get in the truck I'll bring you home no come on just get in here with me he called as I turned and started walking away I was hoping he'd just drive off somewhere else else but he didn't. Instead he drove extremely slow following me, complimenting me and trying to pressure me to his truck. I thought fast of multiple options for different scenarios, but I chose a simple one. I pulled out my phone and while still walking I lifted it up to my ear, pretending to loudly answer a call. Hey dad, yeah no I'm just on interstreet name here. I'll be home in about 10 minutes. I stopped pretending to listen to a reply. Okay you're outside waiting for me? Awesome, yeah we can do that when I get back. Love you. After he heard me say that he took off, tires screeching. I ran back Back home and made it back within about six minutes, actually calling my dad on the way, who made a call to the police, who showed up shortly after and took my statement and description. Turns out there was a man on the loose in my area who was exposing himself to kids and trying to pick them up. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
I started a new job about six years ago. It was great. Really liked all my coworkers, and the job itself is really awesome and I still love it. This was before the pandemic and everyone was in the office every day. I work in a large multi-floor, multi-wing building filled with numerous businesses and agencies. I started getting into a routine. We have a gym and locker room in our building. I would go work out before I was on the clock and shower, get ready, etc. I'd go get breakfast at the next building over most mornings at around the same time. I'd go on walk breaks with coworkers at pretty much the same time every day. It was very regimented. In the morning when I worked out, everyone had a pretty set schedule. We didn't know each other, but there was kind of an unspoken pattern. A co-worker would finish and shower before me, then I'd go, then the head maintenance guy for the building, and so on. This is where it all begins. One morning like every other, I get out of the shower and I'm in the small locker area and there's this little older man over at the sinks. He's not doing anything but looking at himself in the mirror, but you could tell he was just loitering. Weird, but whatever. A few days later, he's there again. Then he's there every morning at the same time and he's definitely looking at me while I change. This creeps me out so I stop working out in the morning. Then after a few weeks we're walking back from getting breakfast and he's walking the other way towards the other building. I tell my coworker that's the guy that would always be in the locker room watching me get dressed. After a few more days he's walking the other way from us getting breakfast every day and he looks right at me every time. So I make an excuse and stop going for breakfast. Our 9am walk around the building he starts just appearing and walking the opposite direction from us every day. Literally everyone walked around the building in the same direction except for this guy and he'd stare at me as we passed. I'd tell the coworker who was a woman about the guy and what had happened and she just laughed it off. The only reason he'd go the opposite direction is to make sure he saw me. Our 1pm walk around the building, wouldn't you know it, he's there walking the other way and staring. So I just stopped going on walks at work. This is where the real magic begins. I have no clue where this guy worked in our building. I would come into our hallway every morning at the same time. From the time I went through the doors to the time I got into my office, it was maybe 15 seconds. We were on the first floor and at the end of our wing is a staircase. Every morning as I'd come into our wing, he would pop out the stairwell and come walking the opposite direction and stare at me as we passed each other. One morning, I'm walking into the bathroom to go number two. I stop and blow my nose real quick. As I'm walking to the back stall, he comes into the bathroom. We have two urinals, two stalls in this particular bathroom. No one is there but us. He comes into the stall next to me, widens out his feet so his shoe is under the divider and on my side of the stall. This dude is tiny, maybe 5 foot so he'd have to almost be doing the splits. Then he lets out this deep loud moan after about 30 seconds then leaves. I start telling all of my coworkers. most of them laugh. I felt so creeped out and helpless, like what do I do? Any guy I work with that I tell this about laughs at me. The women just shrug it off or have an excuse for why he is always there. So I ask one coworker to pick any event at any time during the day to prove he will show up. So we decide to go out for a walk at noon. After 5 or 6 days there he is. Now she believes me. Everyone in the office knows now. I have told my wife all about this and she is supportive. She has had her share of workplace creepers as well. I get to read the texts and emails. My closest coworker and I decide to start working out at 1.30pm every day. I want to get my gym time in but I don't want to do it alone. After about a week and a half, guess who starts showing up every day? He'd just come in and loiter around. Mind you the guy has never tried to talk to me before and vice versa. Two guys lifting weights and this little old creepy guy just sitting there watching me. Here's where it hits the peak. My lifting buddy had a cut out early one day. My stalker is there with us. I was just going to leave but screw that I don't want to let this little weirdo control my life anymore. There is an elevated padded stretching platform on the weight side of our gym. He takes his shoes off, lays on his back and starts doing hip thrusts in the air and holding it while he stares right at me. I'm walking around trying to pretend I don't notice him while he follows me with his eyes, pelvis elevated in the air. After 20 minutes of this, he puts his shoes back on and goes into the locker room. I'm texting my lifting partner and wife the whole time telling them this is going on. My wife tells me to confront him, I don't. I get in the locker room to grab my bag and he's at the sink. The top couple buttons of his shirt unbuttoned and he's rubbing water all over himself while looking at me in the reflection in the mirror. That was it for me. I started working from home almost exclusively after that, then the pandemic hit and I've been remote ever since. This happened Sunday night. I got into a very huge fight with my mom and it was very emotional and intense to say the least. We made up and said goodnight to each other but I was still pissed off. So my impulsive self decided I was going to take off for the night, I just wanted to cool off. I went into my backyard and hopped over one of our walls and started to walk around. Mind you, it was midnight, I didn't even have a phone in case something happened or a weapon for self protection. For a bit of a layout of my story, down the street from my house, which is a neighborhood road, there is a church and a preschool across from it. In front of the preschool 
preschool there are large, tall hedges that sort of hide the pickup slash drop off that's in front of the school. There's a stop sign on the church's corner before the busy main road and a street lamp on the same corner. I made my way down to the corner on the church's side. I was very bored and cold but it's not like I could call a friend to pick me up and hang out for the night. I decided to face the main road and put a hitchhiker's thumb up in hopes of someone pulling into the street and letting me use their phone to call a friend. After what felt like forever, I was getting no luck and then I saw a guy from across the main road and I called for him. I didn't have any weird feelings about him, he was harmless and he let me use his phone but I still wasn't able to find any of my friends to come and get me. Before he left, he asked if I had a knife on me or something. I said honestly, I forgot mine at home. And he handed me a small but very sharp switch blade and told me to keep it to stay safe and have a good night. After watching him walk into the dark heading east, I wandered up and down the sidewalk as cars passed by often. I started to pass the hedges and I glanced over to the left of me where the school was. I saw a large silhouette of a man slowly creeping around in front of the doors to the small preschool. He was tall and looked like he was strong, broad shoulders too. It took me half a second to realize he stopped and saw me too. I went into flight mode and immediately nooked out of there and ran across the busy street because it was empty at the moment and kept sprinting until I was five streets down and realized he wasn't following me. About 30 minutes had gone by and I decided it was time I made my way home. I eventually crossed the street and was facing the main road walking down to the church and take a left and get home. It was silent and no cars had gone by for a few minutes at that point. Then I heard a car speeding down the road and I turned my head back to see if it was a large white suburban. I dismissed it thinking nothing of it as it turned right a few streets down across the road. I started to turn the corner under the street lamp when I looked back up again and saw it was starting to come out of the same road it just turned into. I don't know what told me to run but I did. I ran into the parking lot of the church and started to see headlights turn into the street. I threw myself onto the ground behind a ramp wall that was barely tall enough to hide me. I was trying to stay silent at the same time because the suburban's headlight reflected off the walls of the building as it pulled into the parking lot. It made a few laps from what I could sneak a peek of and stopped in the middle for a couple of minutes before it turned out and drove into the main road. I waited it out a bit longer and pulled the knife out listening for anything and everything. Once I realized I was probably in the clear, I ran back home. I'm a French student doing a master's in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I live alone in an apartment in a building where there are only students. I'm 22, enjoying life peacefully. To give you a bit of context, I live in a calm, good neighborhood. The only noises I'd hear are the tram or parties in the building since a lot of students are there. One night around 10pm, I hear a knock on my door. I live on the third floor, and to get to my front door, you have to open the main door which needs a key. And then you need to open the door to my corridor with the same key. So people who want to come into my door must must have the key, call me or ring at the door so I could open the doors for them from my apartment. Nothing of this happened, I just heard a knock on my door. I usually open the door without a second thought, whether it's my landlord or a neighbor asking for something. As I told you, I feel pretty safe in the building, but this time, for some reason, I had a bad feeling about this. I didn't move at first. I thought the person would just leave. I had finished my assignments, however, the knocking continued for 30 seconds. I said, yeah, in English. The person knocking doesn't say anything. I ask in English again, who is it? The voice answers in English, it's Uber Eats, which is weird, because Dutch always speaks Dutch and I recognize the voices and accents of everyone on my floor who have the key to access the floor. So it wasn't a neighbor, it wasn't my landlord, it was somebody claiming to come from Uber Eats. But the issue is I didn't order anything from Uber Eats that day. The voice was unfamiliar, in case it's a prank or a neighbor pulling a joke, it was also a deep voice, at least 40 and probably a smoker. I replied that, I didn't order anything, you must have it wrong. After a few seconds, the knocking continued in the same voice says, I'm pretty sure you did. I have an order under your name. I start panicking. I look around to pick up a knife in case he breaks the door because the knocky was getting a bit louder. I checked if my door is locked. It wasn't. I was literally 10 centimeters away from him. My front door was the only thing keeping him from me, and I'm glad it doesn't open from the outside. You need a key to open it even if it's not locked. I step back and I ask again, what's the name? He seems to be thinking for a few seconds. Then a final knock occurs. It was loud and it translated some anger or frustration. Final Finally, I hear him going down the emergency stairs right next to my apartment. The steps were heavy and the person was clearly in a hurry. I don't know what he wanted or what would have happened to me if I had opened the door as I usually do. I still haven't understood how he got through the two doors and why he did come specifically to the last apartment on the third floor. Did he try others before? I posted a post about it on the WhatsApp group we have in the building. No one saw anything suspicious. No one opened the door for anyone. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.